So imagine this scenario. I'm driving from my home in Palo Alto, California, to the Pacific Ocean. And there's a small little mountain range uh, between. And it's a <clears throat> relatively narrow, winding road. And it's really fun to drive. I just love to drive it in my sports car. I have a Porsche. And so I'm driving along, having fun, taking the turns with oh, great skill. When I notice my wife, and my wife is sitting there with her feet against the floor and her hands against the dashboard, and she's scared. And so I say, what's the matter? It's OK. I, I know what I'm doing. It's, everything's fine. And what's bothering you? New story. I'm driving my car from my home in Palo Alto to the Pacific Ocean over the same road. And I'm enjoying it just as much. And everything is going wonderfully until I notice my car is scared. The seat straightens up. The seat belts tighten. The shock absorbers get tight. And the car starts beeping at me. I say, OK, OK, I'll slow down. The modern cars do this, by the way. I'm not making this up. Question, how come I trust my car more than I trust my wife? <laughs> Answer, I don't. <laughs> but there's nothing I can do about it. With the, my wife, I can ask her, what really is the trouble? I mean, you know, am I really scaring you? Uh, should I slow down or, it's, or what? With the car, there's no conversation. The car has all the power. And that's a well-known problem, by the way, in bargaining, or well-known issue, or well-known ploy. So Ken Ford is a great bargainer. He probably uses this. If you want to negotiate a really good contract with somebody, who do you send to do the negotiation? Do not send yourself. Do not send the CEO. Do not send the person in charge. Send a lower level person. Because then when the negotiation happens, suppose a lower level person is convinced and is about ready to give in and give away more than you want it. The person will have to say, I'm sorry, but I'm not in authority to make a decision. I have to go back and check. And then the person can always come back and say, my board won't let me, or the boss won't let me, or whatever. And so the people with less power often have more power. So you never should negotiate for yourself. You should always have somebody else to the negotiation. Now, it's interesting, because I told this story to a nephew, uh, sorry, a niece of mine, <coughs> who's a lawyer. And she said, huh, I never let the other side get away with that. They send someone without the power to make a decision. I say, I'm leaving. Well, see, the car doesn't give me that choice. The car won't let me bar argue with it, won't let me bargain. It simply decides what is safe and not safe and what it should do and what I can do. So this talk is about what is happening with automation in our lives. And most of it is coming into the automobile, but it's also coming into the home. And I'm afraid that what's going to happen is not necessarily good. There's a long history of automation in industry, in chemical plants, manufacturing plants, in ships, in aviation. But the story there is very different. In aviation, for example, we have highly trained pilots doing a very well-specified task. And when something goes wrong, and it always does, or occasionally does, um, the pilots have time to figure out what to do. If you're in a modern jet aircraft, and suppose everything goes wrong in the cockpit and the plane starts crashing to the earth, you have a couple minutes because you're five or six miles up. And there's actually a considerable amount of time. And there have been a few major incidents where everything did go wrong, and the pilots had no idea what was happening. But they saved the plane, because they were able to figure out what to do. So actually, aviation today is incredibly safe. But we have highly trained people. In the automobile, we have ill-trained drivers. And you might have a half a second. 
in the airplane, I've known of pilots who fall asleep. I have at least one case where they fell asleep for several hours <coughs> until the scientists who were working in the back doing their experiments said, they were, well, we're all finished. And they called up to the cockpit and said, you can go back home now, and no answer. And they went in and discovered everybody asleep. In the automobile, if you fall asleep for 10 seconds, you're probably dead. It's a big difference. So that's what this talk is about. Working with modern automation is a little bit like riding a horse. So think about the car. The car is actually a pretty intelligent vehicle. And the car <coughs> knows when it's in danger, knows when it's straying out of the lane, knows when it should brake. Uh, the new BMW 7 Series will parallel park by itself will enter the garage by itself. So if you have a tight garage, what you can do is get out of the car. <laughs> Seriously, honest. And then push a button, and it goes in all by itself. The, the Toyota Prius, for several years, has been able to parallel park by itself, but only in Japan. It's only this year, next year, they're about to enter, do it in the US. The difference between Japan and US is the lawyers. <laughs> Many of the high-end cars uh, keep know when they're in the right traffic lane. And um, some cars beep at you if you drift out of your lane. Other cars vibrate the seat. Um, <clears throat> the Honda actually turns the steering wheel, trying to get you back in lane. So these cars are getting to be smart. And cars with adaptive cruise control, when they think you're about to crash, they do all that I told you about. They do straighten the seats. They do tighten the seat belts. They do adjust the shock absorbers. They preload the brakes. And uh, the Lexus has a TV camera that looks at the driver. And if it doesn't look like the driver is paying attention, the Lexus just brakes. <laughs> and wait till you try to go to your refrigerator to eat something. Well, your refrigerator talks to your scale. <laughs> no, you can't eat that. <laughs> it's happening. It really is happening. And it's in, it's, some of them are in products, and some of them are in research labs. All around the world, people are, all these wonderful scientists, clever scientists, are trying to control your life. Not because they think it's good for you, but because they can do it. Think of riding a horse. A horse is kind of like this car. It's, kind of, it's intelligent. It has its own mind. It decides what is good or what is bad. And you, the rider, are kind of in control, but you only have partial control. So the horse does part of the driving, if you will, and you do part of the driving. And when it's a really good combination, uh, the two of you are working in concert so that you signal to the horse what you'd like to do. The horse signals to you what it wants to do. And a good rider knows to listen to the horse, because the horse often knows better than the rider about what is safe or dangerous or the best way to go or the best gait. And uh, sometimes riders override the horse, overrule the horse. And sometimes riders listen to the horse when it's a good team. Now, there's another problem, though, with a horse and rider. It's like when I ride a horse. When I ride a horse, I have no idea what is going on. I can't control the horse, and the horse knows that. And the end result is very uncomfortable for both of us. Well, I'm afraid that the modern automobiles may be more like me and the horse. Now, <clears throat> the automobile is kind of like the horse and rider, right? And years ago, I developed um, in my book, Emotional Design, a simple way of describing how the brain works. So this is simplified, but accurate. So think of the brain as having three levels. The one called visceral is biologi biologically determined. It's where we're born with a tremendous amount of knowledge of the world, if you will. It's where we have fear of heights. Even a newborn child is afraid of heights. It's where we like sweet tastes and dislike bitter tastes. It's where uh, we like a happy, smiling face and dislike a frown frowning, angry face. We can tell the difference between a soothing voice 
mm-hmm, and an angry voice. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what the language is, you can tell whether somebody is pleased or unhappy. Um, newborn babies, in fact, babies before they are born, while still in the womb, can tell the difference between scolding and uh, reassuring. Uh, dogs can tell the difference without speaking a language. So this is all, we're born with this. Now, most of this you can't change, although you can learn to overcome it, because some of our favorite foods are bitter foods. But if you remember, almost all the bitter foods um, we had to learn to like. I was in Korea a couple of days ago, and everybody eats kimchi, this pickled cabbage, for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. But even the Koreans admitted that, new, that young children dislike it. They learn to like it. The behavioral level is learned. That's where we learn all of our skills. And when you're really good at something, you do it subconsciously. So visceral is unconscious, and behavioral is unconscious. And this is where this is mostly learned. <clears throat> Both these levels are very important in both cognition and emotion. We are emotional creatures. Now, this may be the Institute of Human Machine Cognition, but I think it should be the Institute of Human Machine Emotion and Cognition. <laughs> what emotion is about is evaluating the world, deciding what is safe, what is dangerous, what is good, what is bad. So the visceral level is actually very important. It tells us whether this is heights, the fear of heights, which you feel in your stomach. Um, or good. And that's actually very, very important for our survival, good or bad. That's why the emotional system is so important. It, it controls the, our, all of our muscles. And that's why you can tell a person's emotional state, because evolu in, from the evolutionary times, emotion was sort of getting the animal ready to respond. And sometimes if the animal didn't know which way, we would just tense them, it would tense the muscles which means it's ready to go forward or backwards. We can see that. And so over time, we've evolved to read emotions and, in fact, to signal them. So the face is filled with muscles, most of which signal emotions. They don't have many other functions. About 30 pairs of muscles in the space, in the face. And we're very good at reading them. So we're very emotional creatures, which is good, not bad, because emotion, remember, is about value judgments. So. Visceral is all about the current state. Is this good or bad for us? Behavioral is about expectations. Uh, what do I expect to happen? Is it going to be good or bad? Uh, and what did happen? Did it match what I expected or not? So we get surprised when there's a mismatch. And a bit of comfort when there's a match, although even comfort when we predict something bad and it happens, it's still at least we predicted it. The reflective level is very different. Reflective level is where consciousness is, where uh, your self-image resides, where we do things sometimes for the impact it has on others, like the way we dress, like the kind of car we buy, like the watch. The watch isn't about telling time. You don't buy the watch in the technology store. You buy the watch in the jewelry store. It's the kind of watch you wear. It says a lot about who you are. Same with the kind of car you, you drive. So three levels. Now, the human <coughs> people, or basically every animal has a visceral level. Um, and as we go up the chain, uh, the, be the behavioral level gets more and more powerful. And you get to the very high level, reflective level, only um, advanced mammals, primates mainly, have much of a reflective level. Horses do. But it's the human who has the biggest reflective level. So we take a look at the car. The car is now working at the visceral level. And the car decides whether it's safe or dangerous. And the car is also behavioral, because it knows a whole bunch of things. It has stability control. It has anti-skid control. Uh, it has lane keeping control. It has parking. But it doesn't have any reflective level. The human driver has a reflective level and the behavioral level. And what you got is a new kind of creature. It's called human plus machine, or human plus automobile. One word. Human plus machine is a new creature that has the 
reflective level, the consciousness level is the driver. And then there's a mixed behavioral level where, in fact, if you're not careful, you're fighting with each other. And then there's a lower level, which is sort of the mechanics. The modern cars, as I pointed out, are starting to do more and more of the thinking for us. And there's a good reason for it. In the United States alone, we killed 43,000 people last year in automobile accidents. Six million people were injured last year in automobile accidents. That means most of you know somebody who has been killed in an automobile. Most of you know somebody who's been injured in automobile accidents. Probably most of you have in your family someone who's been injured in an automobile accident. They are deadly. And so there's a big attempt by automobile manufacturers all around the world to improve the safety of automobiles. The problem is that this is being worked on by engineers. And engineers don't understand people. <laughs> Here is an uh, engineer. This is a Honda. And <clears throat> notice, once upon a time, the steering wheel was a steering wheel, right? You turned it, and the car turned. Um, more and more, the steering wheel is going to be disconnected from the car. It'll be just giving in commands to the computer, which will decide what it should do. Um, and notice all the things. There's a volume control there on the upper left, and an on-off switch, and a mute switch, and a telephone switch, and two other things. I don't know what they are. And um, there's the <coughs> cruise control up there. And down here is the lane keeping control, which you can turn on and off. And the Honda, as I've said, <laughs> this is a Japanese car. It's actually, this is in England, so hence it's a right-hand drive. But in Japan, it's a right-hand steering wheel as well. Um, but this is. Uh, Channel4.com, which is a, uh, a car internet site in England. And so they're trying to illustrate that, hey, we have cruise control, and we have lane keeping control. We can read a book. So let me tell you about cruise control. Cruise control is so you can set your car to go at a constant speed. The problem with cruise control is if someone always comes in front of you and you've got a brake. So the engineering solution is, oh, we'll put a radar in your car and look ahead. And if somebody comes in front of you, we'll slow up. And they do it so that you keep a constant distance in seconds between you and the car in front of you. And the engineers first put in two seconds, because that's with a safety statement. But two seconds turns out to be a big gap, and other cars kept coming in. And so, <clears throat> so they made it one second, and then one second is, well, pretty close. So they're still playing with what number. At least at the Toyota actually lets you choose one, one and a half, or two seconds. It goes all the way down to zero now. It used to be that it turned off at 30 miles an hour. Now it goes all the way down to zero. So in rush hour traffic, right, you don't have to do anything. You just drive along, and if the car in front of you stops, fine. You'll stop, and the car starts. Well, actually, they make you start it by hand. You've got to push something to start. But between lane-keeping control and adaptive cruise control, you don't have to look anymore. There is a problem with these, however. So here are the problems. I'm in rush hour traffic. I'm following the car in front of me. Well, a pedestrian comes in. Oops. The light turns red. My car doesn't know that. So good old engineers are in there trying to say, oh, we'll put in a red light detector, or a stop light, or a stop sign detector, or a pedestrian detector. Adaptive cruise control. You're driving your, adapt your car with adaptive cruise control. A friend of mine told me the story, because it happened to him. In the San Diego freeways, it was a crowded freeway, so the car was going relatively slow. He, was, he had set it for, I don't know, 60 or 70 miles an hour, and the car was going 20 or 30 miles an hour because it's slow. And he'd been doing this for about a half hour. So he forgot it was on adaptive cruise control, and now he gets to his exit. So he turns off to his exit, and the car says, hey, there's nobody in front of me. <laughs> So I told this to my friends at Toyota. 
And their first response was, what a stupid driver. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, come on, you can't design for (laughs) for your impression of people. It's designed for real people. And then the engineer I was talking to said, well, it actually happened to me once. (laughs) And he said, well, we can fix that, because we're going to couple the adaptive cruise control to the navigation system. So we'll know you're on an exit. Okay. Here's the problem with all this intelligent stuff. It isn't intelligent. The intelligence is in the designer's head. And and the designer says, oh, let me see. They're having trouble if a car comes in front. We'll put a radar. We'll tell the car so we'll slow up. Well, what happens when you want to get to the exit lane? Oh, that was interesting. I didn't think of that. Oh, we'll look at the navigation system, and we'll know you're on the exit, so we'll slow up. Well, I told this story to my friends at Ford Motor Company, and they said, oh, we have another problem. You're driving along, and you want to switch lanes. So you wait, and there's some little gaps that you can squeak into, and you jump into the other lane. Well, your car suddenly notices that you're too close to the car in front, so it breaks. The car behind you is, well, it's all right that you stuck in front of me, but then you slammed on your brakes. (laughs) So the Ford people asked me, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, the Ford people asked me, they said, maybe we could put a special brake light in the back that said, don't blame me, the car did it. (laughs) So what is going on here is that as we build these intelligent machines, the intelligence is in the designer who can't think of everything that's going to happen and can't measure, doesn't know all that's happening around, doesn't know what you have in your mind. So what the designer decides to do may not be at all what you need to do. And there's always unexpected things that happen. And there's two things we understand about unexpected things. One is that they happen all the time. And second, whenever they do happen, they're unexpected. (laughs) And that's one of the problems with these systems. But it gets worse, or better, depending upon whether you're the engineer or the driver. So the next hot thing coming along is swarm behavior. Swarm behavior is what scientists, biologists, love to talk about. You, know, you see those flocks of birds in V-shape, and they're following the leader. They're not following the leader. They have this really wonderful little algorithm that basically schools of fish, herds of deer, or whatever, um, flocks of birds, <coughs> swarms of bees, they all follow the same algorithm. Basically, they keep as close to each other as they can, but they don't touch each other. The birds like to always have a bird kind of off to its side. That's what leads right to the V. Notice they don't, they, sometimes you have a V, but sometimes there'll be a W and so on. So they like to sort of have a bird off to one of the sides or the other side. And they don't like to touch each other, but they like to get close to each other. And they, they all sort of follow along. And um, that way, they, they really zoom in all over the place, and they seem to follow each other. They're not following the leader. They're just following a very simple algorithm. And the, actually, the film people helped, helped develop that, because a lot of the special effects you see uh, in film today is all computer generated using this algorithm. It's very realistic. And they also, if there's ever an obstacle, they, they don't want to bump into anything. That's part of their algorithm. And so they'll separate and flow around an obstacle in very nice ways. So this means that a highway, the modern automobiles are starting to get, after all, we all have in our computers wireless transmitters, right? So, and receivers. So the cars have them. And the cars talk to each other. It's called ad hoc networks. And as the cars talk to each other, they know where each other are. So the cars can do swarm behavior. Or if it's a single thing, we call it platooning. So there's already was an experiment in San Diego of a whole host of cars platooning down the highway. And with cars can therefore travel just a foot or so from each other. Because if the first car has to brake, it immediately tells all the cars behind that it's braking. So you don't need any real distance between the cars. And when you platoon, those of you who are bicycle riders know that's called drafting. It makes, it's a lot more energy efficient for the cars behind. The first one, if you will, breaks the air path and the rest follow along. And it's also faster throughput. You get many more vehicles on the highway than um, normal driving. So 
Swarming is just, if, if you will, a two-dimensional platooning. And cars can be all over. You don't need traffic lanes anymore. Traffic lanes are because you don't trust the other drivers. And if you stick to your lane and I stick to my lane, then we won't crash into each other. But if you don't need traffic lanes, the cars, you can crowd them in together more and get more cars per area. You don't need stoplights or stop signs. You're coming to an intersection. Well, this car and this car will negotiate. So this car might slow up and this will speed up. So let's go past. See, I've seen these wonderful simulations in laboratories where the two streams of cars just pass through each other. In theory, <clears throat> if you had the courage <clears throat> and you were a pedestrian, you just cross the street. <laughs> right? They'd all just weave past you. So there's no leader, there's no need for lanes. Well, all this would be fine if the automation really were that intelligent and if it really worked all the time. But there's a long history of automation failures. Now, we don't have enough experience yet with the automobiles, although there have been a few stories. Um, but we don't have really hard data. So most of the data comes from uh, NASA's Aviation Safety Program and the National Transportation Safety Board and also uh, ships. So let me tell you some stories. And I, <clears throat> years ago, I used to do work with NASA Ames and aviation safety. But actually, one of the problems with aviation is that it's too safe. So there, there are many years go by when there's no accidents, no deaths, nothing to study. That's, that's scientists. I actually had dinner once with the chairman of the board of Southwest Airlines. <laughs> and he said, well, son, maybe we could help you. <laughs> So he promised he'd give me an accident. And then, guess what? There was one uh, Southwest Airlines accident. Um, he was joking, but there was a real accident, and I'll tell you about it. So we don't have enough aviation accidents. So let me tell you about the cruise ship Royal Majesty. And it's sailing from St. George, Bermuda, to Boston. It's a <coughs> holiday cruise ship. It's completely navigated by a global positioning satellite, GPS system. And um, this is the kind of display that you see in the, I was about to say cockpit, whatever you call the equivalent of a cockpit in a ship. Thank you. This is what you see in the bridge. Um, so this is a display. Notice it's latitude and longitude in <clears throat> degrees and minutes and hundredths of a minute. And one one hundredth of a minute is about 60 feet, 20 meters. So you're giving the position accurate to roughly 60 feet. And this trip takes, I don't know, two days. Well, that will be fine, except that after they left Bermuda, shortly thereafter, they're not sure when, and nobody knows why, but the wire that went from the, the GPS satellite antennas to the navigation equipment was disconnected. So they weren't navigating, they were guessing. Now the technical term for guessing is dead reckoning. <laughs> <laughs> what that means is they take the last known position and then they, they guess how fast the ship is going and in what direction and they compute where they ought to be. Um, and the problem is it doesn't take into account winds and tides. Now, you can tell that's a guess by looking at the display. Can't you? Well, look, it says DR. Dead reckoning. Well, it may not surprise, oh, but while we're at it, they also give you a nice map. So this is a radar display a map showing the area, and this is the ship location, a nice, precise point, even though it was guessing. Nobody noticed they were guessing. Nobody noticed the DR. And so here they are from Bermuda, <coughs> and they're on the way to Boston, and notice Cape Cod is in the way. <laughs> 
And when they got to Cape Cod, they were 17 miles off. Now, that's actually very good guessing. After a day and a half or something, they're only off by 17 miles. Well, this is the circle. <clears throat> that's the radius of the circle is 17 miles. And you can look at the size of Cape Cod. That's a big error compared to Cape Cod. So here they are sailing along, thinking everything is going perfect. They're plotting the position on a map. They keep checking. They know where they are. They're getting close to the harbor. And suddenly, <clears throat> the ship goes aground on a shoal off of Nantucket Island, which is, I believe, this island. And it took two days to get it off and many millions of dollars worth of damage. Nobody was injured. So there was a big study, you know, all sorts of examinations and studies of the accident. And the question is, the question I ask is, well, why did they make the equipment that showed the accuracy, extreme accuracy, when it was guessing? And it knew it was guessing. It isn't that the navigation system knew, you know, thought it was accurate. It knew it was guessing. It knew it was dead reckoning, yet it still gave you an indication accurate 60 feet. Last, well, this year, no, last year. Last year, there was a Southwest Airlines accident at Chicago's Midway Airport. This is the Midway Airport. It's right in the middle of the city. It's known to be a dangerous airport. It's a fairly short runway. And if you look, you see that the streets are right at the edges of the runway. And what happened here is this airplane is going to land on this runway. It was raining, so the runway was wet. It's going to land on this runway, and it did. And it ran off the edge of the runway there, <coughs> ran off the airport into the street, hit a car, and killed one of the passengers in the car. It's a short runway. And on top of that, where do planes land? You don't have the whole runway. You can't aim a plane to land right starting here. You aim it someplace in here. If you see that black line, that's brake marks. That's wheel marks. When you hit the wheel, you've seen a little puff of smoke that comes up as the wheel comes up the speed. And so you can tell where the planes have been hitting. And you can see most planes hit in this area. This particular plane, or this particular time, hit late. So it landed further up on the runway. Still within the safe boundary, but longer than it should have than most do. It was wet. So the plane had to break. And one of the things you do is you have called reverse thrusters. You you put a you take the jet engine and you sort of make it point forward. So it's you know how do I do that? So the thrust normally pushes the plane forward. This way the thrust pushes the plane backwards, reverse thrust. Well they didn't turn it on right away. It took, I think, 12 to 15 seconds before they turned it on. And normally it's turned on faster than that. And nobody yet knows why the delay. The investigation is still ongoing. They don't have a result. But <clears throat> the combination was wet, landing a bit late, no reverse thrusters for a while. They went off the runway. Before they land, the pilots enter information into a landing computer. And this is not the screen, because I couldn't get a picture of the screen. But this is the landing computer for a different airplane. So it's the kind of thing, this is kind of what it would look like. And so what you do is you enter the information on the left, and it tells you the information on the right. And on the left, you say how high the elevation of the field is, the barometric pressure. Um, <clears throat> The temperature, the wind direction, and wind speed, uh, your heading, and a few other things like how heavy the airplane is. <sighs> Someplace in here, you should also have the the, out, the speed at which you land. Um, so you don't know all these numbers. You enter this information like 30 minutes before you land. And you actually have to tell it also, this, this computer isn't as fancy as the one they used. You have to tell it how wet, how slippery is the runway. Well, how slippery? Well, it's sort of, you're told that it's dry, slightly wet, wet, very wet. 
and you enter that in. And it's a guess that the airport makes. You don't know the weight of your airplane. You know sort of what it's manufactured to be. You know how many passengers are, passengers are on board. And you multiply each passenger by a standard number, which is sort of a rough estimate of the passenger's weight plus the kind of baggage they might carry, which you don't really know. <coughs> and actually, those numbers haven't been updated for a while. People are heavier now than they used to be. You also don't know how much the fuel weighs. You have a guess. You know how much fuel you put on board. You know roughly how much you've burned. But again, it's a guess. And you don't really know the wind. People, it's a rough estimate. And mind you, that's an estimate 30 minutes before you actually land. So why on earth does it tell you you're supposed to land at 108 knots and um, that you need 2,809 feet? You can't control the landing speed that accurately. And it tells you accuracy to a foot when you have to enter all sorts of information that's a guess, an estimate. So what happened is they were told they still had a couple hundred feet to spare. They could land. But they didn't count on the fact that the afterburners didn't come on right away. Had they, when you do the same computation without afterburners, it says you don't have enough room. With afterburners, they do. And again, they landed a bit, they hit the ground a bit late. Where's that in here? So the question I ask in both these cases, the Her Majesty's ship and this one is, why is the information presented in such an accurate format when they know it's not accurate? I'll come back to that. So those are the problems in automobiles and the problems in ship navigation and the problems in aviation. And what about the kitchen? Well, here's a sort of thing that goes on. <clears throat> here's a paper from MIT. What if, under, what if your appliances could understand what you need? And it says, <clears throat> well, you know, we notice that when someone goes to the freezer and then goes to the microwave oven, they're probably going to defrost something. Well, how do they know you even actually took anything out of the freezer? Maybe you went to the freezer, opened it up, and said, oh, no, I won't. And now you come to the microwave oven for who knows what reason, but they're going to suddenly, <clears throat> the microwave oven is going to say, ah, I can defrost for you. What's, you know, put it in, and I'll defrost. It will help you. Um, the houses are trying to mind read. And all around the world, people are building smart homes. One of these days, IHMC will decide, hey, we should build a smart home, because that's where the action and activity is. It actually is kind of a neat thing to do. It's a good way to experiment about all these wonderful technologies that we are learning about and testing. But there are two different ways of building smart homes. Almost everybody is doing it one way, this way, the MIT way. <clears throat> Microsoft in Redmond is doing it. There's a house in Singapore, they're doing it. There's a house in Hong Kong, they're doing it. There's a house in Denmark where they're doing it this way. Uh, <clears throat> there are houses all over the place trying to read the mind of the user, trying to say, here's what we should do. Oh, I see what you want. Or, no, you shouldn't eat that. Or, oh, I see you're in a bad mood today, so I put on some cheery music for you. Turns out, by the way, the psychologist will tell you, if you're in a bad mood, you do not want cheery music. <laughs> There's a BMW had some problems with his navigation system in Germany. So I asked one of my friends who's a professor at Stanford to look into this. And because um, so Cliff Nass has been studying um, emotion and devices and so on. <clears throat> and he discovered that, well, in Germany, it turned out it was a woman's voice. Men drivers didn't like to be told what to do by a woman. So they had to switch it to a man's voice for Germany. It turns out women's voice is just fine in the US. Um, <laughs> no comment. But he also, while he was at it, he, tried to, he, he did some experiments on the mood of people. So he had some sarcastic, nasty instructions. Hey, <laughs> turn over here. <laughs> Or, you didn't turn like I told you to. What's the matter? Versus cheery, uplifting instructions. And it turned out if you were in a bad mood, you hated the uplifting, cheery instructions, and you liked the nasty ones. 
And if you're in a good mood, you hated the nasty ones, and you liked the uplifting ones. So what Cliff keeps saying is we have to match the mood of your instructional system, your navigation system, to your mood. So now the cars are going to try to figure out whether you're in a good mood or not. <laughs> what kind of music should I play for you? How should I address you? Then there's a former student of mine, Mike Mosier, who in, lives in Boulder, Colorado, and has instrumented his home. It has five miles of cabling, <laughs> sensors all over the place to see where he is and what he's doing, and a big neural network, because he, he studies neural network computers. And so <clears throat> what his house does, it has all this stuff in it. And if he's sitting in the room, in the living room reading in the morning, and he gets up, the house knows he's going to go off and go to the university uh, to work. And so it turns off the lights and, gets, and says he gets it ready to shut down. And at night, if he's doing the same activity and stands up, the house knows he's probably going to bed. And so it turns on the lights in the hall, going to the bedroom, and turns on the bedroom lights. And it also chooses music for him. It also controls the heating, the <clears throat> et cetera. And it tries to save energy. So it always turns on the light the least amount it can that he think, the thinks will satisfy him. And you can train the house, though. So basically, you can say, bad house, bad house. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if it doesn't turn on the light bright enough for you, you, you break it a bit brighter. And the house says, oh, and remembers that. And um, Mike says that actually, sometimes it's a problem. He said, he's a, at the university working, and he's working late at night, and suddenly he realizes, oh my goodness, my house is expecting me, and he has to run back home. <laughs> because it tries to save energy, but it knows that when he comes in, he wants a nice warm house. So it turns on the heat just before it expects him to come home. Now, what I don't understand is why he can't call his house and say, <laughs> I'm going to be late tonight. <clears throat> Well, the problem there is essentially the house is trying to read your mind. And actually, Mike lives alone. Well, I don't know that. He's not married. And um, so I think it really would be a problem if there are multiple people in the house. It's kind of OK for him. And it's, it's his own house and it's his own experiment. He writes papers about how well it works or badly it works. So he's actually pretty sensible about it. I wouldn't want to inflict it on other people. But look what's actually happening as we do this. So here's a newspaper article, and I'll read it to you quickly. Well, I don't, you can, can you in the back? The, maybe I better read it. You hate it when that happens? <laughs> well, is there anybody here who would love it when that happens? So this article is a fake, which you can easily tell because of the date. So I wrote this, and I published it in what's called the Risks Journal, which is an <clears throat> a internet newsletter by people who are interested in accidents and risk, computer risks mostly. And actually, a few people believed it and wrote to me in horror about it. <laughs> but it's also possible. I really do think this could happen. You know, all you need is a timid driver. And this Honda, which is actually turning the steering wheel a little bit, 80% of the torque it gives you. So it isn't quite enough to completely control the car, but enough to scare a driver who's trying to turn out, and then this car, the steering wheel turns back. You know, it's a complicated business getting changing lanes when you have a car who wants to stay in the lane. How does the car know what you want to do? Remember the turn signals in cars? Once upon a time, the turn signal was to tell other drivers that you wanted to change lanes. Today, that's how you tell your own car. I really mean to change the lane, honest. Please let me <laughs> use the turn signals. OK, so this is false, but it could happen. Or take a look at the swarming experiment I told you about. All these cars are traveling in front of me at the legal speed, and I want to go fast. And they're blocking the road because they're taking the whole road up. 
well, wait a minute, they're intelligent cars. They want to avoid obstacles. So I just go, vroom. And I know the cars will separate and give me space. And so there's a lot of problems that engineers don't anticipate because they don't understand people. They sort of assume people are logical and rational. And that if there are cars in front of me, well, I'll wait. No, no, I'll just take advantage of your technology, go whoop. There are other problems, too. I mean, imagine coming to a stop, two cars coming to collide. What happens is you come into an intersection, you see another car, most people brake. So your car has already done the computation and says, no, no, it's better to accelerate. It's usually better to accelerate, by the way, because if you brake, what you do is you slow up and give the other car more time to hit you. <laughs> if you accelerate, you might actually get through before the other car. It, it depends. It's not always. It's, but the car can figure it out. But what if the car decides to accelerate and you decide to brake, both at the same time? Who should win? And mind you, the other car is doing the same thing, too. Well, there's a set of scientific work called The Problem of Common Ground. It was mainly done by a, a psycholinguist at Stanford University, Herb Clark, who argued <clears throat> language, human language is actually ambiguous and difficult to understand in, the, in, in isolation. But we manage quite well because we have something called common ground. We both have common assumptions. So we all sort of know the topics we, we all speak we all live in the same society. So there's a lot of things that we can take for granted and not have to say. We all know the context. We know what the intentions of the other person are. There's a lot of common ground. When we go to a different country, sometimes you have trouble communicating because we don't have common ground. We take for, for granted the other country may not. Working with machines, machines have almost no common ground with people. And so the communication is very difficult. And there's a whole bunch of people who have studied it. Andrew Monk, who's a British scientist, has looked into this. And Klein Woods, Bradshaw Hoffman, and Feltovich, um, who all work here. Uh, Klein and Woods visit, and Bradshaw Hoffman and Feltovich are in this room, um, have all worked on this same problem, the problem 10 challenges for making automation a team player. And common ground plays a major role there. Now, I believe that really what the story is is that when you talk about people talking to people, yes, we have common ground. We can communicate. And even when we have misunderstandings, we have very good ways of what's called repairing the problems, of fixing the problems, realizing there's a misunderstanding and straightening it out. When machine or artifact talks to machine, artifact, artifact, machine, and machine, yeah, there's common ground. Um, in fact, I talked today to Pat Hayes, who says he's been on a standards committee for the last several years, arguing with people all around the world to establish a common set of international standards for just this problem. So that there will be, in, <clears throat> when machines talk to each other in what's called the semantic network, everybody will use the same language and will, will understand what is going on. Oh, by everybody, I mean machines. So machines can communicate to machines. It's not easy, by the way, like even finding someone's telephone number. You know, one country labels it as T, another, company, another country is phone, somebody else's telephone, someone else's home, someone else's office. It, they can be labeled and numbered in lots and lots of different ways. So it isn't always easy to know what it is. So, but, but machines, there's a possibility because we all sit down and agree upon standards. The problem is when you go to machine to person, there's no common ground. And so the communication is going to be very, very bad. And that's where the misunderstanding comes. So as far as the navigation system was concerned, I told you I was guessing. Didn't you see the DR? It doesn't know about the human perceptual system. Now, I've been using you for five years, and you never gave me an error before. And you have a great big letters, you know, my position. And then tiny little letters saying, oh, no, that's just a guess. Come on, that's not how people work. So what, here's what I would like to see. So what I would love to see, I like automation. Automation can save lives. Automation can simplify our lives. It can make dangerous things safer. But it has to be done in a way that we can communicate in what I'm calling natural. 
So Holland is a country filled with bicycles. And recently, I was in Delft. <clears throat> and um, bef before I went from my hotel to the university, my host said, now, I want you to be careful that when you cross the square, it's very dangerous because there's just thousands of bicycles. And if you're not careful, <laughs> well, first of all, you'll be scared to death. And second, they're going to hit you. So here's the rule. Don't try to help them. So here we have an intelligent system, namely the bicycle rider on a bicycle, and an intelligent person, I hope, me, walking through. And we can't, we don't have common ground. We can't communicate because there's no time. I can't negotiate with the bicycle rider what to do. So the best thing to do is be predictable. If I see a bicycle coming right at me, do not stop. Do not try to get out of the way. Just keep walking. Because the bicycle rider sees me. And has already taken account of where he, that bike, where he expects me to be. And if I stop, he'll probably run into me. So be predictable. Well, if we have to do that for human with humans, that's a really good rule for machines. If I could predict what a machine was going to do, then I might actually work with it quite well. Be predictable. So are there systems that can be sort of self-explaining? So let me tell you about another smart house. Oh, forgot this slide. So what I want are interactions that are, and I have a long list, natural and predictable and self-explaining and use what I'm going to call natural mappings and are optional that help you. They don't take over, but that are optional and help you. And that exp uh, I won't bother to explain that. So here's a smart house. This is in Cambridge, England. It's Microsoft Research, but not the one in Redmond, Virginia, the one in Cambridge, England. And actually, it's, uh, the work is done by yet another student of mine, Abby, Abigail Sellen. And um, what they've tried to do, they looked at people's homes. And they said, how can we help you? So how can we make it smart, but not in your way? So one of the things they, had, they noticed was families have trouble communicating with each other. So they invented this little message board, which you see here in the kitchen. And what the message board is, <coughs> it lets you write notes. And you can send it notes with your telephone. So here's uh, Richard, the husband, who says, hey, <coughs> I, I, was, you know, I, I was in town. I was late. I just got into the train station. And on his phone, he sends this message. Can someone get me from the train station, Richard? So he sends the message not to a person, but to the message system, because he doesn't know who's home. So somebody sees it, and we'll go get them. But now it's important that everybody else in the family knows that this has been taken care of. They don't have to do it. And so uh, it's a tablet computer. And so you simply scribble, have gone to pick up dad. So one of the kids is now going off to pick up dad from the train station. So it's a very nice system. It's intelligent and smart, but it doesn't take command. It simply lets you communicate better. Or the refrigerator. Is sort of a home message center. You post a lot of messages and things you want to remember, but it gets to be so crowded and messy, you can never remember, right? Who can find it? So they invented these magnets, say a Monday magnet or a Wednesday magnet. You put the Wednesday magnet on the refrigerator, and then when it, Wednesday comes along, it glows. So here's one of the refrigerators, and there's a little, see? Little subtle glow. It's not annoying. It's not going beep, 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 beep all day long. It's just a little subtle glowing, which will attract your attention. Oh, yeah, that's the message I should look at for today. So their philosophy is a really nice one. And Georgia Tech has a home. They call it the aware home. <clears throat> and they have a similar philosophy. And here's what they call the cook's collage. So they're trying to help people who are interrupted all the time. So I'm cooking. And in this case, I'm making a cake. And the notion is this. I'm making a cake, and then the phone rings, or I have to remember I have to do something. And I leave, and I come back, and I can't remember where I was. So <clears throat> what they wanted to do was they, they have this little display. And you can't see it, but there's a TV camera underneath taking a picture of what you do. And the TV display, the display shows you sort of the basic steps, so you can see. Ah, <clears throat> I put in three tablespoons of that and two of this, and now I did that. And so I, 
it always showed me the last six events that have taken place. And whenever I come back, I can say, oh, now I know where I was. So again, it's, it's meant to be augmentative. It's optional. You don't have to pay attention if you don't want to. And it's very helpful and very smart. Or take a look at this map. This is your traditional Yahoo map. This is going from my home in Palo Alto. Actually, here's a nice winding road. Um, you can see it's winding. Uh, but here's going from my home in Palo Alto to the University of California at Berkeley. And this, as you know, is a traditional map. It's a real map, and it shows the path. But it's not very good for pathfinding. And so here's uh, Manisha Grala did his PhD thesis at Stanford trying to do human maps. So this is a map that basically shows you the only things you really need to know, the landmarks and the major turns. So notice it's fairly expanded near my home. <clears throat> go down Channing Avenue to Middlefield that go across Willow Road. And then eh, you just go straight for a while and then take that highway, go straight for a while. And then once again, when you get to Berkeley, it expands to show you the details. So it's not the scale. Because it wants to show you the stuff that matters. So his thesis then was produced by a company, I think it was MapBlast, which was then bought by Microsoft. And then so Microsoft had this on MSN Maps. But then Microsoft developed something called local.live.com for their new maps. And unfortunately, this is lost. But I thought it was really neat. It's really a human-centered map. Turn signals are also interesting. We used to have red signals and green signals. But you didn't know when it was going to switch from red to green or from green to red. And so we introduced the yellow turn signal. And so the yellow was sort of giving you warning that, oh, you should stop now. Of course, people never take it that way. What yellow means, especially in Chicago, is you should go faster. <clears throat> Same with pedestrians. We used to have signals. We had nothing at first. And then we started having hand signals. So the red means don't walk. And <clears throat> what's now introduced is countdown. Have you seen that? So it's kind of nice. It says you have four seconds left. Four, three, two, one. And then it switches to red, and you can't go anymore. Well, but of course, pedestrians use it in the same way, right? Oh, four seconds, I better go fast. Um, so it means I still can do it, right? So Palo Alto doesn't quite know what to do about this. So on, what they've now done on some of the intersections is it goes four, three, two, one, zero. And then it stays green for 10 more seconds. <laughs> and then it switches. That's to allow the people who haven't made it. They just don't understand psychology. <clears throat> what that means is I can ignore that count, because it means I still have lots of time after it ends. Worse, they've only done this on some of the traffic lights. On some of them, it turns red right away. You never know which one you're at until you're halfway through the street. Fortunately, this is California, where pedestrians have the right of way. But it's not true in all cities. And I just came from Korea a couple days ago. And I assure you, in Korea, pedestrians have no right of way. <laughs> so. Can we develop self-explaining systems with natural interactions? And here's a couple of them. <clears throat> My BMW has this really nice feature that when you back up, it tells you how far away you are from the object behind you. It goes beep. And as I get closer, it goes faster. Beep, 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 beep. When it's continuous, it means I better stop. Now, what's nice about that signal, it's what I call a natural mapping. That time between the beeps is proportional to the distance left. You don't have to read a manual to understand it. You just hear it once, and you get it. You remember it. You know how many things that people explain to you in the technology, and you explain how to do it, and you do it once, and then you can't remember it the next time, and so you have to learn it each time? What's nice about this, I didn't have to read the manual. No one had to explain it to me. It was self-explaining. And once I got it, I got it. Never had to learn it again. That's a really neat natural signal. So what I'm really trying to do is help devise the science of such natural signals. Which ones work, which ones don't. <clears throat> In airplanes, if you are about to stall, 
it used to be that the plane would start shaking and the stick, the control stick, would shake. And pilots learned that that was a very valuable signal that they were stalling. And in big modern aircraft, you don't get any such warning. So they made it artificial. They, they're me measuring the airflow over the wing. And when <clears throat> you're reaching the stall condition, the control wheel yoke will vibrate. And that turned out to be a really good signal to the pilots. And they like that. And it's been very effective. Rumble strips. If you're going off your lane, you hit these strips that vibrate. It's very valuable. And in fact, um, rumble strips are now widely used around the world to mark uh, sidewalks for the blind, because they can feel it with their feet. Or sounds. You can tell. You may not know what it means, but you know when your engine doesn't sound right. Or you know when the vacuum cleaner is sort of stuck because the sound changes. Sound is a natural signal. Because sound is a result of all the moving parts and all the equipment we have. And it, it's sort of signaling to you how well it's functioning. Even though you don't understand it, you can read it. And experienced people can even tell you exactly what the trouble is. Screwdriver slot I like because you can tell whether your screwdriver is working right, is in the right in the slot properly, just by the feel. You don't have to see it. And hand signals. That never means go slower. It never means be softer. It means more. More of whatever we're talking about. And if it's loudness, it's more loud. And so um, that will mean stop. Sometimes when people guide you, they'll go like that to tell you how much distance is left. And once again, that's a very natural mapping. You don't have to, have, you don't have to agree beforehand that I'm going to use my hand signals. If you do it, you know what it means. So there are some natural things. This is the rumble strips. This, is, this happened to be in Japan, but I've now seen it all over the world. The blind strips. So when a blind person is coming down the stairs, a blind person can follow the path properly. <clears throat> um, so I think we actually could do a science of natural interaction. Suppose the navigation system had done that. When it was dead reckoning, it just got rid of the hundredths of a degree. It would still be accurate enough to let you know what was going on, but this would be a clear signal that, hey, uh, I don't really know. In fact, you could even blank out this digit. Maybe you should wait 10 hours and then blank out this digit. Because at first, you're reasonably accurate, but with time, you get less and less accurate. So very simple way of indicating. Instead of doing that, which is almost invisible unless you really look, make it that. You couldn't miss it. Or for the map, instead of a dot, why not an area? Maybe that area should get bigger and bigger and bigger with time. It means I'm not really certain where I am. So those are good examples of um, natural signals. I'm trying to do a psychological classification. I won't bother you with this slide just to show you that I'm doing it. But <clears throat> that's my story. Cantankerous kitchens. Don't eat that food. <laughs> and cautious. <laughs>
I guess my, my question's just kind of muddled all in there, isn't it? <laughs> Haven't heard it yet. OK, well, you get another chance. So, so <laughs> <laughs> what is the question? So the, so the question is, are any of your students or programs um, really focusing on the concepts of cognition as it applies to the human understanding of cognition to the engineering piece specifically? Um, we understand a lot about cognition. A lot has been learned. Uh, we know a lot about emotion. I'm very concerned about the interaction between people and technology. And that's what my work is focused upon. That <clears throat> there are lots of really good people studying pure human cognition, pure human emotion. And I, for many years, that's what I did. But I'm much more concerned today about the fact that technology is done by technologists who have no understanding of, of human behavior, very little. And I happen to have degrees in engineering and a degree in psychology. So it's actually a really good match. And so what I've been focusing upon is, well, what, I, what I'm focusing upon right now is what I've told you about. When I'm working, I have a contract with Ford Motor Company trying to understand how we can give continuous awareness to the drivers. And the driver's always aware of where the automobiles are around them. So the driver knows if there's an automobile in the blind spot, or to the side, or behind, or too close to front. But in a way that's continuous, so we don't have to have alarms and say, oh, you're too close, suddenly. But rather, yeah, I know. The car is behind me, and I know it's getting closer, but I know. So I'm fully aware of that and driving right. So I'm very concerned about this, if you will, joint cognition. Um, between humans and machine cognition. It's this interaction that's so important. And that's what I focus on. Your categories of cognition sound like they come from Piaget or somebody, which is very old. Yes. And, uh, no, I went to school. Okay, well, as a cognitive psychologist, actually, I've never used those categories. But, so anyway, but my focus is on this interaction. You have to wait for the machine, for the microphone. Well, some of the uh, uh, emotions may be genetic. Aren't a whole series of emotions just a series of learned rules as you get older operating in an environment? And, well, and that's what engineers are trying to do is figure out all those rules and then put them together. Well, I don't believe emotions are a set of learned rules. But okay. remember I said there are three levels of processing. The, level, the visceral emotions are uh, this, this immediate gut feeling, if you will, that things are going smoothly, things are good. It's, it's called a positive valence, which feeds all sorts of chemicals into the brain, which makes you actually in a good mood. You're more sensitive to events that happen around, you're more creative. Um, and the negative valence, when there seems to be some possible danger, a, a current danger, no history, those are feeling bad states, and you tend to tense the muscles, and um, you're actually more focused. The hormones make you more focused. That's one level. <clears throat> Those, in fact, my colleagues don't want to call emotions. They call it proto-emotions. It's sort of prior to emotion. At the behavioral levels, the emotions are all expectation emotions, like um, fear or hope, which is fear is excitement about the future. Is that I'm, I have the, I'm afraid that there might be something bad coming up, or hope. And these are all expectation-based emotions. And we have relief when expected fear does not happen. So there's a whole set of middle-level emotions. Those aren't learned either. Now, the predictions are learned. So the things that make us, I'm driving the car, and I step on the brake pedal, and the brake goes all the way to the floor. It's kind of an interesting error, because um, you haven't consciously, in your mind, said, oh, I expect the brake pedal to stop halfway down. But the body is expected because it's learned that. And when there's a deviation from what you've experienced in the past, there's this horrible feeling in your stomach. Um, if you drive a driving simulator, which could be horrible, because most driving simulators, except for the, only about a dozen in the world or less, uh, don't move. So you're driving along 60 miles an hour, and you're in a real automobile body, and you see the scenes around you with good graphics. And then suddenly, a pedestrian steps in front. And you slam on the brakes, and the vision works, slowing you up. But the car doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's stopping. And you get this horrible feeling in your stomach. It's really horrible. People get sick in simulators 
because there's a mismatch between what they expect and what happens. Then at the highest level, we have other emotions like hate and blame. Uh, at the highest level, reflective level, is where we assign credit or blame. So I feel guilty if something bad happened because it was my fault. And I get, have blame when something bad happened and was your fault. And praise when something good happened and was your fault. And pride when something good happened and was my fault. And these are higher levels of emotions. So emotions are very complex, occur at all levels of the brain, are learned and also automatic. And so very, very difficult to describe simply. You can't just talk about emotions. There's all these different kinds. I don't know if that was helpful or not. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I'll let the microphone people decide. Pat? Do you see us continuing in this trend of developing things because we can and maybe not because we should? Well, the trend is about 2,000 years old or longer. <laughs> <laughs> Probably longer. Absolutely. On top of that, I once wrote the epilogue of one of my books, Things That Make Us Smart, was essentially the model of the Chicago World's Fair. I can't remember the year right now. Yeah, about 100 years ago. Hmm? 1939 was a New York World's Fair. No, 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 no. It was. Yeah, like early. It doesn't matter. It was early 1900s. 1893 sounds good. <laughs> anyway, the year is not the critical thing. Um, the model was that science. You know, science uh, discovers and technology builds and people conform. And I said, that's horrible. What I want the model for the 21st century to be is that technology conforms. But I've now changed my mind. I still like the notion that technology should conform, but you know what? We have conformed to technology ever since the invention of clothes or spears or fire or whatever it was. We have modified our lives to take account of the technology. We've paved over the whole country to let the cars go. We've changed the way houses are built because of the internal plumbing, internal wiring. We changed it for electric power. We changed it for gas lighting before that. We changed it for the telephone wiring. We changed it for the internet wiring. We changed it for everything that happens. We accommodate a technology a lot. It's amazing with the rules that we follow and the things that we do, and even the way you're sitting in this auditorium and the way this all works and waiting for the microphone. We accommodate a technology when we think the benefits outweigh the deficits, but we've always had to change the technology. And although in principle we should be studying human needs and figure out what is really valuable and we should build things that support people, that's true, and I don't deny that. But nonetheless, many of our great technologies that we really like came about because some engineer or some inventor just thought of this thing and did it. I mean, it's, most of them have come about from engineering. I mean, take a look at Thomas Edison, who figured out how to send two signals over the same wire for the telephone, the duplex telephone, and improved the telegraph. And you know, in his spare time, <clears throat> invented the light bulb. He didn't invent the light bulb perfected the light bulb, and recognized that you actually had to have a whole electrical distribution system to do it, and thought it should be direct current. And his bitter enemy was Westinghouse, who thought it should be alternating current. And so what Edison kept doing was electrocuting dogs and animals with alternating current to say it was dangerous and we shouldn't use it. I mean, the world is filled with technologists who want to take over and, but they often do produce good ideas along the way, and so we do adapt ourselves to them. And over time, we actually adapt our, both ourselves to the technology, but the technology adapts to us as well in a very nice way. And actually, lighting is going to be a good example. We're right in the middle of a revolution in lighting. And you're going to see lighting change dramatically in a way that's much more friendly. You can just paint a light on the wall. That is, you can paint a light organic emitting diode paint on the wall and let it glow. Um, 
LED lights are just starting to come out. They're still a bit expensive, but they will also, because they're so small, again, they can be pasted and be uh, more diffuse and not interfere with the house as much as these big, massive things do. So, I'm, yeah, technologists will always build what they can. And then that will give us a lot of, we'll always be busy, we'll always have things to do to try to point out the errors and the problems and the dangers. But I also have another important model, which is it doesn't do any good to criticize. So do not criticize unless you have a solution. So as long as we have solution to make things better, that's where my hope comes from. On that happy thought, let's thank our speaker. Thank